Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. Trust get it on mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for telling a friend. We love that about you. Excited about our special one-on-one with Roseanne Barr. Roseanne's got a podcast mm-hmm. called the Roseanne Barr Podcast. Wherever you find finer podcasts. And she's got live shows. She's touring as well all over the country, although mostly Florida. RoseanneBarr.com is where you go for all that. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. It's good to see you. A lot of time has passed. I know. I was speaking to Dr. Drew off the air, and he said, we did her talk show in 98. God. And I have no memory of anything that happened (laughs) before Monday. Uh, Me either. So um, I, I find your story fascinating and i'd I'd like to you know get into it kind of long form which part well we'll start at the beginning okay you grow up in you know less than favorable conditions correct um how do you grow up i i grow up in a poor family in salt lake city utah uh a bizarre family by regular people standards i think um and we were jewish in a all mormon Community, community mm-hmm. working class community, and uh, so it was always being a stranger in a strange land and in a strange family. <laughs> what was strange about your family? Um, well, every single thing that you can think of. Um, it was a uh, it was a family kind of in trauma because uh, you know <clears throat> being Jewish. Uh, my grandparents, when I was a little girl, I was about three. My grandparents, this was in the early 50s, um, but in, I think, 1948 or so, my grandparents sponsored uh, Holocaust survivors. They had an apartment house there, and they sponsored these people to uh, come to America from that. And so that that's where I lived, and I, uh, you know, grew up in, in that and uh, you lived in your grandparents apartment that was housed with holocaust survivors yeah and uh so that's one weird thing or different thing and uh so we had um friday night dinners at my grandmother's house and she had a a windowsill there where when i was three maybe even younger too i used to uh perform to uh do my Shirley Temple impersonation there in that windowsill. And uh, those people were really happy, and they'd laugh and clap for me. And uh, I liked that I could lift people and entertain them. So that was deeply seared into my consciousness early. Yeah, I think a lot of comedians have that experience, like it's a sort of Billy Crystal thing, where the relatives would show up for the dinner, they would do their impersonations and sort of scat and dance and make have nickels thrown at them. But it was more I am I have discovered entertaining a group at, at a tender age. Yeah, and maybe this could be some vehicle to get out of what is overwhelming sort of poverty and depression. Yeah, it was a lot of that, and of course, my family lied to me and told me I was better than Shirley Temple. <laughs> And so that set into, like, I really believed it, too, because I thought, oh, they just know how fantastically gifted and talented I am. And so that was kind of... So they were bad, but they were supportive simultaneously? Yeah, until I was 12 and realized, oh, my God, I'm not better than Shirley Temple. And it was really depressing when I found out. I was just a fat little dark girl, and I was not indeed better than Shirley Temple. It was real. Then I went into a depressive spiral. Because society had gotten hold of you and let you know you weren't better than Shirley Temple. Well, I saw it for myself. Yeah. So (laughs) now you're growing up in Salt Lake City. Yeah. You have a sort of base foundation of performing. Yeah, I had that. But also in my family, everybody was a comedian. My dad wanted always to be a comedian. And in in our family, um, you know, Ed Sullivan was very sacrosanct, the show, because mm-hmm. uh, there'd be a comedian on it. And my dad would, you know, watch it with me. That was our time together. And he'd like go, this guy, and he'd tell me, um, 
my dad was a big comedy fan. Like I say, he wanted to be a comic himself. And he would tell me, oh, this guy is doing this and he's doing that. And then this guy, he would explain comedy to me from his point of view. And he had all the comedy records. And also, he was, you know, semi-violent, my dad. And uh, um, he had been a football player and so all that stuff, you know. Um, you know, a working class guy. And uh, so I found out early that if I made my dad laugh, he wouldn't hit me. What was your dad doing for work? Um, he and his father had their own business called the Bar Specialties Company, where they went door to door and sold crucifixes and 3D pictures of Jesus to our Mexican neighbors. And, um, it, and so, uh, you know, and then they would come to collect their money at every welfare payday. They get $2 from each person. And so that's what they did. I oftentimes look back at these times, and I think it wasn't like it was 60 years ago. It seems like it was 300 years ago. Like that's what it seems like to me. Society was completely analog, completely mm -hmm. different, just going door to door. Mm -hmm. Door to door salesman. <laughs> right. Um, so how do you get out of there and start into, into your life of comedy? Um. How did I get out of there? Boy, there's a good question. Um, let's see. I left home for the first time when, well, I left home finally when I was 18, counted down the days. Were you abused at home? Yeah, I, it was an abusive household. It was crazy abusive, though. How do you define that? <clears throat> well, to, um, well, just in every way, uh, mental. So so emotional, sexual, physical, mental. yeah, physical, mental, um, no boundaries. Uh, you know, they continued what had happened to them. That's how I say it. They were abused. Yeah, and uh, so uh, I'm thinking when I left home. Well, I'll, mm. I'll buy you a minute and ask you if your parents were around long enough to see your success. Oh, yeah, definitely. And they were very proud of it. That's good. I'm yeah. always happy for that. And we made amends yeah. in my life with my parents. So that all ended. You know, I, I put it to bed. You know what I mean? We, we, did what, we did the work that you do to move on. And you got pregnant early-ish? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, I think about all these things that happened. I haven't thought about it for so long. But yeah, I got pregnant out of wedlock when I was, what, 18, 19? As soon as I left, did I leave home? No, I was home when I got pregnant. Yeah, that's all a part of the continuing saga. Child was saga. given up for adoption. Yeah, continuing saga. Yeah, my child was given up for adoption, and... Uh, I knew I would see her again when she was 18. Uh, that was just an overwhelming feeling I had, which came true. And now she's 53, and we've uh, you know, been back together since she was 18. She has a kid of her own now. So how do you get out and get into comedy? Well, I left home after I had that daughter. I left home, and I went to Colorado, and I lived on a commune. And I just... Uh, Got a couple jobs, and I was always funny, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I had three kids and got married. And uh, I started in that time always writing, you know. Yeah, I was always writing funny things. And I got a couple of things pun published. And then I got a job as a cocktail waitress, and, you know, I started just letting the shit fly with my customers, and it was in Denver. And uh, one of the customers said, you ought to go down to that comedy club down in Larimer Square, and I'm like, what? And it was like, whoop, all the hairs were standing on my body. It was like an electric uh, response. And I just knew, because all my life it was there, and I just knew that I was going to go down there and do comedy. I just knew it. And so I did, went down and did five minutes. It took me a year to write it. Mm -hmm. And I went down, and I did my five minutes, and I never quit. How did it go the first time? Killed. Really? I killed the first time, and I was, like, so happy because I remember going home. I was like, fucking, I'm getting that Eddie Murphy money. I'm getting out of here. I'm getting a fucking divorce, and I'm, you know, I had it all in my head. I'm going to make my life good. And uh, 
uh, the second time I came back, bombed like a dead dog. You know, that happens. Yes. You know. And so then it was a long crawl back to doing as well as I did that first time. Like, you know, they say chasing the dragon when you do heroin the first mm-hmm. time. It was a lot like that. And that took a long time to master the five minutes. It was all about that five minutes, you know, at first. How was your husband with it? Um, well, he helped me to write. He was funny, too, and uh, is funny, too. And, you know, he helped me to write it. And the jokes were all about our family life together, uh, you know, the domestic goddess thing. And my sister helped me write. And, uh, you know, it's just trial by error when you keep going on stage every week. And, you know, you did basically the same thing, but you perfect it. You know. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, he was very supportive, would watch the kids when I would go down there on Monday nights. And then pretty soon I would get Monday and Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it just grew. And then pretty soon I had 20 minutes and I could middle for somebody. And then after I had about— This is what year, approximately? Um, I started in 1980, and that was about 1982 when I could begin to middle in, mm-hmm. in clubs. And I would start going to other clubs, and I— I remember I middled for Sinbad. Wow. That was one of my first big gigs. And uh, me and Sinbad drove from uh, Denver to uh, Kansas City, and I middled for him. And, uh, you know, then pretty soon I start headlining in those little clubs, and people saw me, other comics, and they said, oh, you should come to L.A. and audition for Mitzi Shore because she's the mother of all comedy, you know, yep. at the comedy store there. So I did, and that was 1985. And uh, I was very prepared with my five minutes after five years of work in it, you know. And right. uh, so when I, I went up, I came off, I really killed too. And uh, Mitzi said, go do 20 in the big room. And all the waitresses said that she had never done that before, taking somebody from audition to the big room in the same night. And it was just like a dream. And in the, I did 20, and um, in the audience was George Slaughter, mm-hmm. and he was doing a show, uh, Women of Comedy. And he came up after and asked me, did I want to be on this TV show, Women of Comedy? So, of course, I said, yeah, I'm going to go back to Denver and settle up, get my kids taken care of, and I'll come back and do it. Came back two weeks later to, uh, you know, rehearse for that show. And Jim McCauley of The Tonight Show was in that audience, and he came up to me and goes, Roseanne, I, I, uh, I'd like to put you on Friday night while I damn near crap my pants. Yeah. And I went on that Friday night, and Julio Iglesias was the guest and asked me if I would open for him on an 18-city tour. It was like bing, bing, that, bing, bing. It that was, was a Johnny dream come Carson true. era, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, when that, that's all you had to do was get on Johnny Carson and— you had your career in front of you, and that's what happened to me, thanks to Johnny Carson and all those people. And uh, then I got my show because of the 18-city tour. I had a lot of press, and uh, I kind of got uh, popular and had enough press to bring it to networks to see me, and they gave me a deal. And I went on the air and was number one in three weeks, three episodes, yeah. knocking Cosby off. I don't know. It was a God-given moment. You know, I think it was just... Uh, I, I was just very lucky, and I was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, people don't realize how big the network sitcom was back in the day. Yeah. I, I don't think they understand. Yeah, we had like between 32 and 42 million viewers a week. Right. And so, you know, an episode on girl, well, of Girls with Lena Dunham gets 250,000 yeah. views and people are talking about it. Mm-hmm. And this is 35 million uh-huh. people. And the compensation was insane. Everything was insane. It was really insane because I was making a million a week back then. There should probably be like three million a week now. Well, if you just do the L.A. gas prices, it'd probably be like <laughs> yeah. fifteen million. Yeah. Well, yeah, an you're episode. right. I don't even know what it would equate to now. A million? Uh, you were the second highest paid woman on TV. I think I read under Oprah only. Yeah, but Oprah wasn't really a network person. Right. She was syndicated, syndicated always. But I, I was at one time the highest paid personality that had ever been on television. Was it 
too much to process at, in the speed that it came to you? Yeah, it was way too much to process, and I didn't process it. I, I worked so hard, uh, you know, between the work I did on the show and then going home to try to live a, a life with the children I had and that kind of deal. I never had time to process anything. I just ran from one thing to another, you know. I, I didn't have a really good overview or a real good plan. I just went from one mess to another, and I put most of everything I had into the script and the show. And I'm glad I had that focus because I might have really spun out of control far more than I did. They tell me there's a clip we found from 1998 with uh, me and Dr. Drew doing your show. Oh, boy. Your talk show as we... Disgust. Oh my God! Look at that. Early, I look just like my on. grandson Ethan. Yeah, it's weird when you get old enough. You can yeah. start looking like others. New York Times writes: surprisingly smart and winning. Tracy and Anka are going to be returning later. If it was not for my next two guests, I swear the youth of America would be even more clueless about sex than they are now. Please welcome <laughs> the host of MTV's Love Line and the co-authors of this here new book. Adam Carolla and Dr. Drew. Feels like a dream, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, see, that's how you are in my mind when I saw you today. That's that's the guy I, I have in my mind. Yes. Full of hope and dreams, <laughs> not crushed <laughs> by life, society, and government overreach. Well, yes. You have such a good show. I really enjoy it. Thanks. You, you People ask you guys weird. Yeah. Lean forward, I can't see yeah, it. It's, I, I'm not so sure that they ask us weird questions, but there's just weird stuff going on right now in this country. Real weird. <laughs> and, and no, one, no one has any second thoughts about asking us anything. <laughs> we, we do college tours, go out and speak to kids, and rooms three, 5,000 people in it, and the kids will stand up and ask these same questions that you hear on MTV in front of the faculty, their peers, and everybody. <laughs> it's amazing. But they have, like, no shame, right? It's uh, either that or desperation. It's, I, it's, 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 it's desperation meets uh, alcoholism. <laughs> Meets, uh, <laughs> meets lack of shame, and t together, there you it go. forms a question. Are yeah. we, do we have a... Well, there it is, everybody. That was a good conversation starter. Now it feels like a dream, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't think people who are young realize that the first part of their life, especially in show business, because everything's fast in show business, yeah. and there's a lot of movement mm -hmm. and going different places, and when you look back on it, it's all very hazy. Mm -hmm. because, no time to reflect. Yes. If you have a job at a mill or a factory and you've been there for 50 years, you just look back 25 years, you've been doing the same shit you're doing tomorrow. You know yeah. what I mean? But this is like, Dr. Drew will say to me, like, yeah, we did Donnie and Marie's talk show back in the day. And I'll go, oh, yeah, we did Donnie and Marie's talk show. Like, everybody's. That's what we did. And I guess we made the rounds with Roseanne as yeah. well. You guys were a good guess. I remember that conversation. Well, I don't, but we were always, we had, we, we had a lot of laps, me and Dr. Drew. So we were always on the short list for guests because we didn't need a lot of pre-production. We weren't some soap actra, actress who didn't have any any fun answers. Like we're always, we did it for a living. But so for you, you go through the first um, incarnation of, of Roseanne, the TV show. Mm -hmm. And then how long... Is the sabbatical before the Connors come around, the second version? Oh, well, the second version was still called Roseanne, and I, I, uh, that oh, was my Oh, then it was the season. Connors. Sorry. Yeah, it was the tenth season. I always wanted to do ten seasons, mm -hmm. and so I got what I wanted. But, uh, yeah, the tenth season was, um, what was that, 2018 that, that came back? 2017. Mm -hmm. And uh, premiered it. Number one with 28 million viewers. And that was fantastic to come back again and um, do it again. It was great. So I guess that leads us into sort of cancel culture. Oh, yeah. Which is where we're, we're living That's now. That's where we're living now, right? Yeah. And the first thing I find about it is I find it to all be very presumptuous. Like I would never in a million years try to remove somebody from something they were doing because I disagreed with their politics or comment that uh, they made. I would look at it as not my role. Like I, I would never go to a club where a comedian was up there just spouting off stuff I disagreed with culturally or politically and then say to the manager, you got to get that guy not to come back. Like 
It's not my role. It's not my place. It's, it seems absurd if you, if you think about it. But somehow one side, the left, has sort of been deputized to do a thing that I just would never, wouldn't cross my mind to do it, especially with a comedian. Yeah, well, they self-deputized. Well, right. Yeah. Sorry. The sheriff didn't tell them they could yeah, do it. They, they have told- no authority whatsoever, but they, except for what they themselves have given, have, have assumed for their own. But, yes. you know, it, it's hard when you own everything, to be fair. You mean you? it's hard to cancel you when you own everything? No, it, it's hard not to cancel Oh, uh, I mean, opposing, when you're uh, someone who questions you when you right. own everything, you know, right? You're meaning you're sort of in charge of Disney and yeah, Viacom you're the royal and, we, right? And Madison Avenue, mm-hmm. and you're going to call the shots because you feel empowered because yeah. you feel like you have the the machine is on your side. Yeah, you have the imper- the imperialist right to right. do it because, after all, you're king <clears throat> well, and then when someone questions you or it, worse yet uh makes fun of you right and you have no sense of humor as king right. well it's your it's your duty to remove the jester yeah the part that disappoints me the most about the chapter we're living in as i've said many times is i don't know why the people like you got into trouble with the Valerie Jared thing, right? Which was prescient if you really can break, if you get what I was saying. I was so right on about today. Right. And we'll get into it. Okay. But what I'm what I'm saying is is I wish more people, whether it was the female soccer player that was kissed by the coach from Spain and got him, you know, thrown out of his job or Valerie Jared who was um, senior advisor of former President Obama, I wish those people just go, oh, so what? They're a comedian. Like, leave them alone. Yeah. Or you know what they can say, which I've said many times, like, I don't like the person, I disagree with the person, but they're, that's their opinion, so what? Keep walking. Yeah. Nothing to see here. You don't yeah. have to make something out of this. Right. They, well, could, they could nip it in the bud. Yeah. Well, like I said, she she always talked about a teaching moment, which is, you know, right. so imperialist. But uh, well, she could have come on my show, and we could have, uh, I could, I could have, uh, the both of us could have had a teaching moment on the biggest show on television, and uh, you know, dissected and discussed. But the thing I find is, uh, and this, I've said before, but two things fascists don't like is humor and dialogue. Mm-hmm. And um, that's what happened. So you said uh, Muslim Brotherhood and the Planet of the Apes had a baby, and that's Valerie Jarrett. Uh-huh. And that is a political tweet. Right. It's not a racial tweet. Right. And but- my defense of that was that I thought she was an Iranian woman. I didn't have any idea. What You know what? I captioned a meme that came across. It was a picture of her next to a character from that movie and Planet uh, of the Apes. Yeah. Um, and it was Helena Bonham Carter in makeup for that. Mm-hmm. And their haircuts are similar and they look very much alike. And it was funny. Mm-hmm. And I captioned it. Yes. I didn't just come out of nowhere with that with that sentence. Yeah. And I said at the time when I heard it and you said, uh, I didn't know the bitch was black or whatever. No, I said I thought the bitch was white. Oh, sorry. Um, I said the same thing. You can't tell by looking at pictures of her what her Mm-mm. ethnicity is. No, she looks Jewish to me. Yeah. Or, you know, Syrian. I don't know. She did not look black. Mm-mm. And I don't even know if she is. I mean, she may be half something she's, and half this. She's or... 38% African American. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So Who cares? She looked just like the fucking picture. I, that's I don't what give I'm... a shit what they say. She looked just like the picture. I cut to the chase, and I captioned it. And it was about a militarized police force, which we have now, and I saw it in the future. I saw that, you know, our country was going to be in a civil war because of ideological differences that she 
very much authored with Obama, and that is where we are. And I was right. I was wildly disappointed in Obama for fanning racial flames. I thought the whole premise of Obama is we were going to elect our first black president, and then we could turn the page on Everyone racism instead of him and now and now Biden just at every turn working race into every conversation, which Absolutely. I find is totally destructive, divisive, and potentially super dangerous. So, so, super so dangerous. dangerous. Absolutely. All right. We need to take a quick break. Come back with more real talk with Roseanne right after this. Simply safe. Well, you're going to squeeze in one more summer getaway before you take off. Protect your home with the latest innovation from Simply Safe Home Security 24 7 Live Guard Protection. With Fast Protect Monitoring, Simply Safe agents can deter intruders through the smart alarm wireless camera, warning them that they're being recorded and that police are on the way. So that's going to send them packing. Best home security of 2023. That's right. U.S. News and World Report. That's what they have to say about Simply Safe. We use these guys. Everyone here uses these guys. And when you move, pack up the system, take it with you. You can't do that with hardwired systems. Right now, my listeners get 20% off the Simply Safe system that they order when you sign up for Fast Protect Monitoring. It's a huge offer, but it's a limited time. So visit Simply Safe, two eyes simplysafe.com slash Adam. Get those savings and a great system. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Blinds galore. Love these guys. Got my new order. It's being shipped. Can't wait to install them. They're turning 25 years of age and they're celebrating with 50% off your entire order during their birthday sale. It's going on right now. Take 50% off of custom blinds and shades during Blind Galore's big birthday sale before it ends october 2nd over two million windows covered family owned and run first place to buy custom blinds and shades online blinds shutters motorized shades that's what i just ordered blackout curtains they've got it all they do our business they do our homes they do our offices they did dr drew's remodeled pool room and it's perfect and you can do it all right from your home just take your measurements, customize it online, even see exactly what your blinds and shades are going to look like on screen before you buy. They have a technique for that. You can do it online and you can order up to 15 free samples. It is blindsgalore.com, right, Dawson? Nobody makes it easier than Blinds Galore to get the custom window coverings you've always wanted in your home. And they've been doing this for 25 years. Celebrate with 50% off during their big birthday sale and let them know that Adam sent you. That's BlindsGalore.com. Hurry, sale ends October 2nd. Roseanne Barr is on the Adam Carolla Show. And you should know that the Roseanne Barr podcast is available on Rumble because yeah. the reason there is Rumble is they're the alternative to many platforms. Uh, Russell Brand was just thrown off of YouTube mm -hmm. and Rumble exists to prevent the government overreach collusion with Silicon Valley and doing their doing the weaponization as we just experienced with COVID of the tech companies and the government collusion in terms of silencing voices they mm -hmm. disagree with. What, which is the definition of fascism? Yeah. So here's the, the bigger question that I've had all through COVID and sort of before this, I get what the government is doing. You do? Well, I get that they have a, they have a goal. And the goal for them would be control. Now, I don't like that that's their goal, but that's their goal. I don't think that's their goal. And there's also big pharma and, yeah. you know, whatever, China. There's a, there, I mean, there's a bunch of moving parts. But the I think their goal is to kill us. Depopulation. They got to get rid of about 90 percent of us so they can live their happy fucking lives that they got planned. Do you think it themselves. goes that, that Oh, I deep. do. I know it. Yeah, absolutely. It's a U.N. agenda. It was 21 and now it's 30. Depopulation. And they take bets on how we're going to die. And then they get, you know, their stock goes up. 
uh, you know, they go, oh, this many people are going to die from this shot. And, and, you know, so they invest in it and get a bonus. And this many people are going to die from the cancers that we uh, also have the cure for and we get the money from the treatment. It's Auschwitz. It is 100 percent wall to wall Auschwitz. And that was their blueprint. And that's what I think. Absolutely. How can you substantiate that? Fact. If you go to, you know, if you line up fact and I, I can send you, I can't sit here and roll it off off the top of my head. But, yeah, I've, I've kept records and I can send it to you uh, just by what they do, by just listening to Klaus Schwab and the WEF, just rolling it down all the way from every U.N. act, everything that they do is to decrease the population. And they say it right in our face. Right, but then where does Anderson Cooper and Don Lemon and Jim Acosta and the LA Times and the New York Times and the entire population of Santa Monica, California, <laughs> where do they factor into this? Well, uh, they is don't. it just useful idiot yeah, shit? Well, they need, they need them. Well, of course they do. And, you know, they just pay them and they'll do whatever. They, they do what they're told. And... You know, they're rewarded for it. People who don't do what they're told are canceled and destroyed and put in prison for yes. 22 years. I mean, that is the fascist You're talking machine. about January 6th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they took a picture and they're in there for 22 years. Yeah, it is a fascist, complete militarized state. And where's Joe Biden in this equation? Along for the ride, just a twig in this river of fascism, or is he... <laughs> actually know what he's what's going on no he has no idea i say that he's jim carrey in a mask because nobody could fall up the stairs like that only jim carrey you mm -hmm. know what i mean and right. so i think he, they all have masks i think i don't even know if they're alive or human they might be cyborgs i mean they might be clones i don't think they're human half of them uh, uh, their their effects and the way they act it looks like they've been coached to act human and you know they can do things on video and television that it, it isn't even them you know, we can't trust anything the media tells us is my bottom line there. Anything you see on media has been cut, uh, you know, censored, made up. I don't believe anything except for the fact that people are dying all the time and they don't even report it. Did COVID get you to this headspace oh, much no. quicker? You were there long I before? I was there, yeah. I saw the Matrix at an early age because I was always getting, you know, I, I, uh, I saw the I saw um, I don't know how to say this right, but uh, since I came to Hollywood, I worked with uh, children who were abused and um, owned by pimps, and I always was a fighter in that arena for children, sex slaves, and children who were controlled by pimps on Hollywood Boulevard that I try to be very involved in. And so I knew from them, the victims, what was really going on behind the scenes and in high up places. So I knew from them what the real deal was. And it was just, uh, it's a, it's a, uh, a system of slavery. And people at the top are making the money, and pe the rich are getting richer, and the poor are getting poorer. How can you dispute that? It's basically that. It is just business as usual. And if the uh, business happens to be very um, profitable in selling human bodies and organs, that's where they'll go. That's just how it is. But is it all commerce? Oh, see, I think you and I differ to the extent that I think mainly, I always say stupid or liar. And I, I feel like- I agree. Most, I mean, you can watch CNN for 20 minutes and there'll be 35 stupid or liar moments right. in there. But I believe people are mostly stupid or sort of useful idiots and not really knowing what's going on. But maybe there's a handful of people at the top kind of pulling the strings. Yeah. But I don't think of- them as nefarious. I think of them as power hungry and money hungry, which ends up makes makes you do nefarious things. But I don't think it's evil for the sake of evil. I think, I think there's the a, middle is like that. 
I think people in the middle, they don't, they're kind of unwitting. Yes. You know, they, they want to believe, oh, you know, they want to believe what they believe. But at the very tip top, the owners of the world, like Carlin said, the owners of the world, sorry to tell you, but they are evil. And they, they, they definitely count how many people they need to get rid of. They do it in every war. They do it on purpose. And, you know, they do own everything. The owners of the world are evil. And then how does this trickle down into Hollywood? And then how did Hollywood get so infected with horrible ideas? And how did they all get on the exact same page? That's my my question is COVID came around and all of Hollywood had the exact same talking points. Yeah, they did. Well, they get them at 4 a.m. They get the 4 a.m. talking points from, you know, the people who serve the owners. But how does that affect Hollywood? How does that benefit Hollywood? How does it work? Well, they keep their jobs because, yes. you know, they have to they have to be useful or they don't get keep their jobs. You know, they have to serve the machine. They have to make sure the machine goes. That's the thing that generates all the money. Right. Right? And, well, you know, if you think about it. It's not like it, they're doing it for their health or for good, the good of humanity. They're getting it paid. Right. And then they get weaponized and then they go after people who go against the narrative. The narrative is all. The narrative is all there is that we get anyway. And the people who invent the narrative, they're all evil. Every last one of them. There ain't a good one amongst them. But They're then, all like devils. How do you account for the smaller group of people who go against the narrative? Um, well, there aren't many of them, are there? They might no. twist it a little and say, well, <laughs> there are some good. That's as far as they'll go. Well, there are some good people. That's as far as they'll go. But they won't ever name it. Naming it is dangerous. No, but what I'm saying is is there's been an, an, an ever-growing group who of people are kind of waking up. For yeah. instance, if you would have talked to me five years ago, and you would have said to me, CDC, Fauci, uh, CDC, R- Rochelle Walensky, WHO, FBI, CIA. I'd go, yeah, well, those are organizations that are here to protect us. Uh-huh. And if the WHO says wear masks, then I would put a mask on because, you know, they know what they're doing and they're looking out for us. Right. And uh, if you said CDC or Barbara Ferrer, she's a health commissioner for Los Angeles County. I'm like, well, she's a doctor. Yeah, Dr. Ferrer. All right, well, let her set policy. Well, who am I to interrupt that conversation and obviously whatever she's doing she's thinking about the citizens of of la and uh rochelle walensky's thinking about the citizens of the united states and the who's thinking about citizens citizens of the world yeah and the fbi is out there trying to root out evil that's what everybody and the thinks. cia is out there doing on an international that's what all scale. the good and people think that's that what I, way that's all I. That's all I that thought. Way. But then COVID came around, yeah. and I was like, well, "What's the FBI up to? And what's Fauci up to? And what's WHO up to? And what's CNN up to? And what's LA Times up to?" So then I became suspicious, right? And I now think of them in a very different way. But there is a group of us who do think of them in a very different way. Doctor Drew was all. Yeah, on board he, he with would, Fauci and everyone else. But then he started looking at what's going on. He was one of the first people to say, wait a minute. Yes. The question is, is why aren't there more of those people? Because they, they just, got it all sewed up. They want their jobs. Yeah. They want to keep their jobs. Yeah. Like, uh, you know, well, there's so many people that are holding on for their retirement funds. And like I say, as soon as they figure out that their retirement funds got shipped to the Ukraine, they're going to be real pissed. And they're going to really wake up. Did you, I know when this whole Valerie It's Jarrett, all mind control. You know, that's what I'm always talking about is how they control us. You know, they control us through the screens, our minds. Keep going. Tell me more. Well, that's what power does. It, it, you know, like Hitler said, you tell a lie enough times and people believe it. And of course, he wasn't the first one to do that. They've been doing that forever. Power lies to keep people in line and control them. Everything's a lie. Everything power tells us is a lie. 
What do you think or how do you wrap your mind around the sort of crazed reaction to Trump? Like your ex-husband, Tom Arnold. Just, oh, he's got Trump derangement syndrome. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I assume most of the people that have it are crazed narcissists. At least that's my head on it. Yeah, I have to agree with that. And also, they're real guilty of something. Oh, you know, really? people who talk about forgiveness all the time. Yes. Instead of asking forgiveness or mm. ever bringing up, I asked forgiveness, but the, I've forgiven everybody. They're always guilty of some shit well, every single time. I mean, it, it, this is my opinion and what I've seen. And people who hate Trump, it, it isn't very long before they get exposed for basically the stuff that Trump's against. That You know what I mean? Oh, well, first off, I, I think everything's projection. It is, because absolutely. It, it was five years. I mean, I know he was only in for four, but it was basically five years of Trump and his corrupt family with his corrupt kids traveling to Russia, picking up sacks of money. Peeing on prostitutes. Yeah, who knows what Trump and his guilty family syndicate <laughs> is up to. And it's like, well, that sounds exactly like Joe Biden. Exactly. Bingo. See, it's all... It, Absolutely projection. And Joe Biden's up there on the debate stage going, look at his family. He's the one who's out there. Don't talk to me about China. I never talked to anyone about China. My son did nothing wrong. (laughs) Remember that one? (laughs) I've never spoke to my son about his business before. I mean, I feel like it's all projection. It's Alinsky. It's Saul Alinsky's stuff for for communist takeover. Uh, Blame your opponent for what you do. Accuse them of exactly what you're doing. So I mean it's a communist takeover. You believe that, right? Can you see it? I I well, okay, here's what I see. Okay. I see the government has grown by leaps and bounds over the last few years. Mm-hmm. And the government I've said it many times. If you took um if you took beavers and put them on the roof of the Empire State Building, they would start looking for wood to build a dam. Right. Because that's what beavers do. I love that. And government does government. Mm -hmm. So the more government you get, and the more government you hire, and the more government you employ, and the more government you empower, the more rules. And they just sit around thinking of insane things. Like, well, maybe we could put some sort of timer on people's uh, dishwasher so we could (laughs) shut it off at 5 p.m. or something. Mm -hmm. Like, that's literally... I also think, and I'll be very curious about what the domestic goddess has to think about this. I think there's too many women, too much estrogen, and too much of that kind of thinking that's been infused into government. Most of the crazed lockdowns that met... I, I will say this in all candor. I, you're I think be women shocked. are more vindictive than men. Oh my God, you are going to shit yourself when I tell you I 1,000, I'm 1,000 with you on it. I know it's true. This is my whole, I see it. It's absolutely true that women have been weaponized against women's rights. It's all a mind control thing. Where these women now, I just, I just call, I mean, I am so with you. And they are doing the work that men, that the worst men can't get away with doing anymore. Right. They sent in their troops, you know, their I, I say I don't even use the word feminist anymore because I I was part of uh, equality for all human beings, you know, that nobody would, you know, that everybody would have the same rights under the law and the same, you know, if they were brilliant, the same opportunities. Not an idiot getting the same opportunity as a genius, for Christ's sake. That's that's. That's heinous, the worst kind of anarchy. But they do send in their uh, fembots to do the absolute worst shit that men can't get away with anymore, and largely to women. Yeah, they, they, I have in my act now where I say, how many? I mean, I would go, my new act is like I just ask the men, like, how many of y'all are getting? You know, I go, how many men here are getting beat up by their women? And, you know, you would be shocked at how many men raise their hand. I go, yeah, they're just beating your ass while you're trying to do the dishes and raise the kids. <laughs> Am I right? And they're like, yeah. It, it was a complete hourglass flip. Same techniques, but different, different window dressing, just like Obama. 
He's bush, but he's that color that people on the left have a sexual fetish for skin color. Mm-hmm. And yes. they're the worst racists that you've ever wanted to meet in your life. Oh, well, listen, I mean. Do you see what I'm y'all, saying? Oh, listen, here, okay, I'll give you, I'll give you racist and then I'll give you. Well, ult- Joe Biden's the biggest racist in the world. Did you just hear him call LL Cool, cool J LL Cool Boy? Oh, no. Now we got to find that. Oh, he did. But to be fair to him, he doesn't know what he's saying. But No, but he is a racist oh, that no, hung I, out I, with, uh, you know, bird, and, yes. bird. Yes. No, listen. Here's, Everything he says is racist here's, here's and what anti-Semitic, I'm too. You making a racist joke about a black man, you know, being hung like a horse or having a high vertical leap or something, maybe that's a racist joke. You saying black men aren't capable of getting IDs so they can vote. That's ultra racist. That's insanely racist. And remember when he said, uh, uh, what do you say, black? What do you say? White kids are something are just as black kids are just as smart. He I, did, like I, I don't he know said, what like, it was, a hundred of them. Black kids are just as smart as poor kids or something, something like something that. But, like he, that. but he also says stuff like the really super racist stuff is like black businessmen are as good as white businessmen. They just don't have lawyers or accountants. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to now, Dawson, the, you got to find that one. I That's love a great it when one. The, then the black uh, liberals, the Democrats come and they defend him. Well, we're now at the point where it's, it's just if, all bullshit. if he's on your side, that's that's it. So I'm going to ask you and we'll find those. It's a we unified field of cool bullshit. Boy. We have LL Cool Boy. I haven't even heard that one. I saw it today. Two of the great artists of our time representing the groundbreaking legacy of hip hop in America, LLJ Cool J. Uh, <laughs> by the way, that boy's got, he got, that man's got biceps bigger than my thighs. I think he's. Been... <laughs> okay. Now, if that, that were, if that were Trump, oh, yeah. that'd be it. That'd be that'd it. That'd be it. And CNN would, would go apoplectic on him but trump would never be that ignorant well trump can think at least yeah i don't i don't know that biden's synapses are firing i i don't i don't know that he's irresponsible for what he says anymore because he can't think clearly anymore like i say i think that i i sometimes i think and people say this that it isn't even reality it's just a show well, Do you, have yeah, you thought of that? No, I. You look when, when Bill Clinton's in power, and even Obama's in power, and even Trump's in power. You think, all right, well, maybe I disagree with this, or I agree with that, or something. But I sort of think that they're here, and that they know what they're saying. When it comes to Joe Biden, Joe Biden, they put him in the Oval Office. They take. Uh, transverse man and number 17 he sits down next to this person and what i see is a doddering old man looking at a person he's never seen before and wants no audience with so we can take up you know it's like it's like basically when there's a wedding back in the 80s there'd be a wedding and they would go to each table and it's and they'd film, you know, say a little something about the right. bride and groom. At some point, there was Civil War veteran Grandpa Eugene Wilson, who was like ninety eight, and he would look into the camera and he'd go, "I want to wish uh, Tammy, your your great granddaughter's name is Tammy, uh, Tammy, and her her hus her hus her husband a fruitful but bot mitch it's a wedding we're at the wedding <laughs> oh oh uh, uh is there more pudding is there, yeah. okay thank you you thank you great grandpa Eugene thank you and you you see that footage you know like ten years after he dies you know and you go right oh he didn't know he didn't really know where he was. Yeah, you know but I, mean? I that's, think that's part of that's, the show so that we all kind of feel sorry for him. But it doesn't matter uh, it, whether he's relevant or not, and he may not be. But look what's happening under his administration to our country. So they might be putting in, him in there as a clown show yeah. so that we go, oh, that poor old man, he didn't know what he's doing. But look what is happening during his administration. Our country is being destroyed from every direction. And uh, that is not an accident. That's the question. All right. One more quick break. Back with Rosanna. Hopefully we'll find that clip of him talking about the black entrepreneur. Um, We'll do that right after this. 
Let me tell you about Angie, homeowners. You know, it's a lot of work to own a home, whether it's uh, everyday maintenance, repairs, or dream projects. It can be hard to even know where to start. All you need is Angie. You're home for everything home. Find a skilled local pro who will deliver quality and experience. Over 20 years of home service experience. Bring them your project online or with the Angie app. Answer a few questions and Angie handles the rest. Look, you're busy. You don't have time to do all this stuff. Let Angie handle it. Take care of just about any home project in just a few taps. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit online. Visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. A-N-G-I dot com. That's Angie. Let them do all the heavy lifting. Well, good news. It's O Rewards Member Appreciation Month at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Get the most out of your membership. Shop, earn points, and get rewards sent right to your phone or email. If you're not an O Rewards member yet, sign up. It's quick and it's easy. You can do it online or in the store if you like. Just ask one of their professional parts people about joining O Rewards next time you visit, and you can start earning points on your first purchase. Sign up for both email and tax and get even more out of your membership. And right now, members receive two times, three times, up to eight times O Rewards points on select purchases. Those bonus points can help you get to your next reward even faster. You receive a $5 reward for every 150 O Rewards points, and you can use your reward on your next in-store or online purchase. So don't miss O Rewards Member Appreciation Month now at your local O'Reilly Auto Parts store and O'ReillyAuto.com. Roseanne Barr in studio, the Roseanne Barr podcast available on Rumble and also live shows coming up. Yeah. RoseanneBarr.com. As promised, I think we have Biden talking about the wealth gap. Oh, no. The data shows young black entrepreneurs are just as capable of succeeding given the chance as white entrepreneurs are. But they don't have lawyers. They don't have. They they, they don't have accountants. But they have great ideas. Oh my God! Does anyone doubt this whole nation would be better off from the investments those people make? And I promise you, that's why I set up this All right. national. All right. They don't have accountants or lawyers, but they could get them. I, I feel they're not capable of. It's 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 soft bigotry of low expectations. I mean, it's real bigotry. You you it you is. think black Absolutely. people aren't up to the challenge of life in America? That's oh what you God. think. Yeah, that is. And guess who their savior is? You and your party who are going to come in and lower the bar for everything. Pardon the pun and make it so. Right. That they can succeed. Well, you can see when you go to Democrat cities, which I've I made it my mission to go to uh as a as a lot of other people who really wanted to see firsthand what's going on and it's just it's just uh, worse than fallujah it, and it and it is primarily black people living homeless on the street for the most part in democrat cities and boy they don't tell you that do they and and uh it's a war zone. It's a murder capital, and that's all, all under the Democrats. And I'm sick of it. I'm sick of their bullshit. Well, and they're going to have to. They're going to have to take account at some point, someday. The reason you're sick of it, and I'm sick of it as well. Just the hypocrisy of it. The the hypocrisy of it, one thousand percent. But also, it'd be one thing if this group, who you claim to be a huge champion of the uh-huh. black community was troubled and having a lot of difficulties, high murder rate, you know, drop out. I just saw a story that the 14 schools in Baltimore, they had 0% black community who could do at math, you know, math at grade level, so on and so forth. Okay. Highest illiteracy. It, it would be black family, 70% are wedlock. Okay. I could take the part where the Democratic politicians said, we're trying to help this community. 
Uh, we need to be doing more, and we might need to change our direction here because clearly some of these policies were 50 years on, have not been mm-hmm. fruitful or working. But we are, the, we are a better group to take care of it. They don't do that. No. They go, it's working fine. It's and, Trump's and, fault. And you're racist. It's Trump's so fault. So you're in charge of these communities that are predominantly black, that blacks vote predominantly for Democrats, like 93%. Up to you, their lot gets worse in life every year. Every year. Yours gets better, and then you call the other side racist. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. Well, even if the other years side of is genocide, it is a yes. genocide, and it's like per, on, it isn't an accident. It's on purpose, and you know they were the party of the KKK. They were and are. They were the party of uh, Jim Crow. They opposed every civil rights thing, and uh, for some reason they managed to uh, hoodwink and bamboozle us that it that it was the Republican Party, which was the one of Lincoln that actually ended slavery in this country, they managed to bamboozle and hoodwink us into thinking by projection that it was just the opposite. And you can see it. You can see it if you just look. Yeah, well, projection, projection, projection. By the way, when you're talking about blacks, I don't think you say hood and wink. No, you do say hoodwink if if you follow Malcolm X, and that's what he said, and he was so right. And he was so right talking about economic sovereignty within those communities, too, because I'm about to do a whole bunch of shows on on what America owes the black population by way of reparations, and I, that's a huge subject that I'm very excited to get into, because I think that that was part of what Trump was doing with his economic plan. And people don't know that either, but that's a whole other subject. You have any predictions with Trump? Um, Well, I like I told Tim Poole when I went on. I don't think there's going to be any election in in twenty four. I don't think we're going to have an election, and I kind of pray to God that we won't. And how would we not have an election? Well, because it's so corrupt, we don't want it. We don't want another corrupt election, another fraudulent election, another stolen election, another machine-led, you know, fake ballot election. We don't want that. So we might need to boycott it altogether till it gets straightened out for, uh, you know, uh, we want paper ballots and same-day count. Until we get that, I don't think we should have nothing to do with it. I agree. And one side says they want democracy you and know they want uh-huh. fair a lot more projection but mm-hmm. they want mail-in ballots mm-hmm. you can do it two months beforehand and you don't need any id if you go to the polling if if you show up to, to cast a vote so i would argue well which is it which like is who it? wants yeah. border security the one who wants to build a wall or the one who wants to tear down the wall it's, exactly it's, it's of, all double basic. speak isn't it well so it's projection orwellian. it's orwellian double speak projection and i'll, I'll kind of tell you where i come down on the stolen election, as uh, everyone makes a very controversial mm-hmm. subject. I don't know enough or have enough information to say, oh, Dominion, their computers were rigged or the ballot boxes were stuffed or any of that. Now, I'm sure there's been a fair amount of... Well, of- Carrie Lake just won a thing in Arizona about the uh, fake signatures on the mail-in. So... All over the country, and of course they don't report on any of it, but uh, it was a whole host of different ways. It wasn't I, just one thing. I do not. I but do all not over the country, that. there, you know, people are coming whistleblowers and proof that it wasn't just machines. It wasn't just uh, you know mail-in votes. It was a whole ton of stuff. I do not dispute that. I'm saying I don't have the facts. But, but it said but, any fraud. But well, I'll tell you what any I do. fraud at all. Well, is I'll tell you, to- I'm sorry. I'll tell you where I think the fraud comes in. Uh-huh. The fraud. Facebook. Co- yes. Yeah, Twitter, I knew you were going to say that. That is the all, proof. All, and by the way, I mean, let's really just think about this. You, they have polled Biden voters, mm-hmm. and they said if we knew about this whole hunter biden laptop and the collusion and in ukraine and the and that 50 spy guys said oh that it's all russian right. dis- if, so they're all had, in on it too right so where i'm kind of at is you know ballot boxes stuff at home uh, motor voter you know um all that stuff fine but there were about 18 percentage votes who if 
the New York Times and Twitter and all the sort of big tech companies, along with the former heads of the CIA and the FBI, mm-hmm. all didn't sign that document that said it had all the markings of Russian collusion. That's election interference. And so me. was the previous four years of Trump's presidency right. with them saying he's a Russian He's a Russian Asset, what, yeah. knob. Uh, cat's paw, I think they mm-hmm. would say. Yeah, so there's tampering. Look. It's mind control. It, it is. It, it's also kind of, but the part that I keep getting back to is that most Americans are neither here nor there with this information. I mean, especially after being lied to about COVID yeah. for three years and everything else. It doesn't seem to bother them, which... They just That's turned scary. off. They they had to just turn it off because like they don't have nine hours a day like I do and mm-hmm. you do to sit and read, read, read. They're busy with their lives. They just turned off. I don't blame them. They've turned off because they're smart. Um, now you're set for life financially, right? I hope so. If I live three more years, <laughs> <laughs> but you can't really be canceled anymore, right? Fuck them. I'll come back out of the goddamn grave. Just I'm not going to let them win. Right. They're devils. Well, I've said I've been a little disappointed by the comedian community, especially during COVID on all this, which is I said, look, the reason you become a comedian is so you can say what you want. And They're then, scared. I get it. But Plus, they don't know what to say. A lot of them, they think it's just dick and fart jokes. Come on. But you know what? you got to come down to Rogan's Club in Austin and see... Ah, ah, inspiring comics. Oh, really? Amazing, brave, fucking in-your-face, red-blooded comics there. And, 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 and there's no censorship, and there's no woke. No woke. And it is just fucking phenomenal. You, you would love it. I want you to do that. Uh, well, tell Joe, because I, I will come down there okay. and happily do multiple sets just or whatever witness. they want. Well, come and work, but witness. Well, I want to perform, too. Yeah, uh, perform, too. But doing, doing I just that. go down to witness. I was like, these young people, shit, they're on fire. Well, they were created by all the people that were trying to silence them over the last few yeah. years. And this mm-hmm. is what I, I keep saying to everybody. You created Tucker Carlson, and mm-hmm. you created Joe Rogan, and you created Candace Owens, and you created... Um, Ben Shapiro, you've created all these Don't people. Don't blame me for Ben Shapiro. <laughs> Come on, he's in the tribe. You, you created all these people because you're trying to mash people down like like a whack-a-mole game. Mm-hmm. And now we have Greg Gutfeld, who's number one right. in, in nighttime, in, in the evenings, because... You tried to smash everybody, and a certain group, half the country won. I want to hear what these people have to say. Yeah, they make them bigger. But I like Greg, Greg Gutfield. Excuse me. I went on his show. He's smart, and, and uh, it, it's a funny show. And it's an alternative frame of mind, which people need to hear. I agree, and I just— Like, I got so sick of Colbert and his fucking arrogance. God, I don't think that shit's funny. What an arrogant son of a bitch. You know? No, it's preaching yeah. at, a, at a certain point, and it goes past, way past funny. Yeah. So for you, are you rejuvenated, invigorated? Like, I feel like there's a little of a rebirth of Roseanne. Yeah, yeah, I do. I feel that way since I went down there, you know. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I feel it like, yeah, like. I mean, you want to get out, you want to share your wisdom, you want to tell your jokes, you want to share what you've gleaned, I what you get know. Up on, I want to get up on stage and make people laugh real hard again. You know, like in the beginning when I was like, fuck it, you know, I'm going to go on there. And I would follow 25 men right. or what have you, and I'd be like most of the time the only woman. And so there would be all that buildup about what they would say about women, and I'd just come in like – you know, like a bowling ball and go, here's my, what I got to say about it and knock them all down because I'd been set up so well. And it's like that again. I, I've been set up so well by all these uh, 
by all this liberalism that's out there in the joke sphere. I've been set up so well that I can come in and, and say, hey, here's my, you know what I mean? Do you see what yeah, I'm saying? No, you you were, I guess, I, I, maybe you were like. I can say the other side that hadn't been heard yet. And okay. I felt like, hey, it's back. It's like my some my daughters go, oh, mom, you're in your fourth Saturn return or whatever shit they say, them kids. Yeah, but, but it is like that. Yeah, you felt you were young, mm-hmm. you were vibrant, and you had something to prove. And then, yeah, I was hungry for and hungry, hungry for it. Yeah. And then you got super wealthy. Yeah, and the world, the weight of the world, and everyone sort of realizes when they come successful. It's like, oh, you got to talk to an attorney every other day, yeah, and that's someone's true. getting sued again, and there's a shitty <laughs> divorce, and everything's a shit show. Yeah, that's true. And then you true. get a little disillusioned with why bother being successful if it's going to turn into this. You're so right. And then you get a little dormant. You go, fuck it, I'll just sit home and watch Fox. And then at some point, you get rejuvenated. Like some some admiral that needs to come out of retirement because you're losing the naval battles, and you go, I must get back on that battleship and well, hit the open seas. I felt like that when I came back to do uh, the reboot, you know, because I thought, Jesus, uh, you know, plus ABC was begging me to come back, and I thought, well, this is a good time for me to bring that message of love that I felt I brought in my show was uh, the family's all. They got a lot of problems, but it's just love, love, love. And I thought, well, this was a good time to come back and show a Trump hater and a Hillary hater in the same family, but they still love each other. Still get all. I thought that was a good message for our country at the time because I hated seeing all that division. I thought we're not going to survive it. So I had that drive to come back and and do that on TV, which I did for that that season. And then they killed me for it. And Why that, did they have to? They, like it was a, it was the kind of thing that would have been out of the news cycle in seventy two hours. I think Bob, uh, Bob Iger, the head of Disney, he had to because at the time, I think, as I put together later, uh, he had hopes of running for the presidency from the Democrat Party, oh. and I saw that on the Oprah interview with him subsequently. Uh, to what he did and he said that his first phone call was to Valerie Jarrett and then Michelle Obama called him and then so they had to fire me because that you know he couldn't have it was all political and you know it was Susan Rice and then uh, Obama himself called to thank Bob Iger for destroying me. They're such coward pussies it drives me nuts. Yeah it really pissed me off so I was like well you know I I mean, they did try to destroy me, and they killed my character, <laughs> and my character, I say. But did, I, we I disapp- went so far down that I felt like they were trying to get me to do a Robin Williams on myself because they had my character die from an opioid overdose mm-hmm. when, in fact, one of the m- members of our show did die from that, the guy that played Mark Glenn Quinn. Mm. He did die from that. And that was nothing to him to say, we're killing her character like that, too. The person who, I mean, it was so ugly. And I felt like they were, and then they were joking about it, her death. I was like, this is so ugly, so horrible, that I can't let it stand. And I'm going to come back, and I'm going to be better than ever. I had a, you With know, a Norm, network sitcom? Huh? With, you're going to come back doing stand-up, doing other specials, well, not I necessarily to, a, a sitcom? Just come back in comedy because I talked to, remember, Norm hooked me up with Louis C.K., you know? Norm McDonald. Yeah, Norm was a good friend, and he hooked me up with Louis C.K. because I was so bummed, you know? And we talked, me and C.K., and we was talking about one year when they tried to, dis- they tried to kill you. Right. They'd take their jackboot and rub it right into your face into the dirt. It ain't enough that they get you fired. They want no. you dead. Yeah. And, and me and CK, we were talking, and we said the only the only way we could survive it, it was a joke, but it's true, is to come back and be even more offensive. Right. And we made a deal. Yeah, we're going to come back even braver, even fiercer, and e- even more on fire just to to show that they can't win. They can't win against comedy. Right. And it wasn't even ourself. It's like they can't censor comedy. They can't take comics down. They can't do that. This is a freedom of speech country. Fuck them. Uh, look, 
they never stop complaining about McCarthyism. No. And they want anyone who disagrees with them destroyed. And, and deplatformed platform and fired from their job. More projection. And they want you never to work again like they're doing to Russell Brand. They don't want him. And, you know, if he is found guilty, I'll have a different opinion, but he hasn't been found guilty. And they're trying to make it so he can't make no money. And he hasn't been found guilty. And you're innocent until you're proven guilty, in this country anyway. Well, a bygone era. Uh, Sarah Gilbert, cast member, did not stand up for you. No, she, she rushed to condemn me as fast as she could. It was her tweet that got the show canceled when she said, uh, it's terrible when a cast member, she called me a cast member. All right, whose name it's is It's terrible when a cast member is a racist or blah, blah, some horse shit. How miserable do these fucks have to be who get indoctrinated into the system and then are forced to go after people like you who essentially created a career for her? Yeah. Well, they're owned. And she is completely uh, indoctrinated by uh, an alphabet, two or three alphabet organizations that uh, take, will, will tolerate no dissent within their framework. And that's what it is. It was nice that John Goodman had your back? No, he didn't either. Oh, he didn't? No, he didn't do shit. He said something three months later. I, that's the saddest part of that this entire... That is the saddest part to this, me. In, this entire that was thing the that part. drives me... It drove me crazy. It, but it, I had to let it go. Because I was like, well, that's how it is. You, you know where you have to come to the point where you're like, that's what is. And it was horrible to face it. But... That's when I realized uh, it is what it is, but it ain't going to stop me because I'm still funny and I can write fucking jokes. They're not going to stop me from being funny or writing jokes. Fuck them. They can't do it. Obviously, their show shows that they ain't funny and they can't do it well. Fuck them. A positive note to go out on with Roseanne Barr. <laughs> I no, I agree. It. We're at, we're just at that point where you just got to go, fuck you. I'll say what I want. I've had a million people say to me, what are you talking about? Stop talking about it. I go, I'm, I, I'm a comedian. I'll That's say right. what I want. I'll say, say what, what I want. want. That's it. And they That's go, right. well, it's going to hurt this or it's going to hurt that. And I go, well, that's their decision. Yeah, they, they, I don't have a yeah, choice in that. They, they can piss off. And you know what? I enjoyed being here with you. And I want this how I want to end it. Long may it wave. <laughs> well, you can listen to the podcast. Hopefully, I'll be a guest on it. I'd at some love point. to have you on the Roseanne Bar podcast, wherever you find finer podcasts, and Rumble as well. And then she's got live shows coming it's up. It's my farewell tour, by the way. Oh, you and Cher are going to have 15 <laughs> of those. Ro Ro <laughs> Roseanne Bar. Dot com is where you go for the live shows. I'm going to be in Irvine. I'll be in San Francisco at Cobbs, uh, October 14th, 13th, 14th. I'm going to be in Spokane, Washington. Just go to adamcrow.com for all my live shows. And until next time, it's Adam Crow for Roseanne Barr. Say it. Mahalo. <laughs>